It's my pleasure to, to welcome Michael Howe, um, who's the uh, Managing Director and Founder of Cross Border Capital. Um, he has a PhD in economics. He's an expert in global liquidity. Um, and by background, he was a head of um, research at ING Bearings. And before that, he spent time um, with Solomon Brothers in the 1980s. So welcome, Michael, and thank you for joining us here at ByteTree. Great pleasure, Charlie. Good to be here. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your background? I've given the, you know, the, the more interesting side, perhaps uh, um, something that happened at Salomon's. Yeah, I mean, the way the way you put it, I spent time at Salomon Brothers. It sounds rather like a sentence, um, uh, a jail sentence. Uh, no, actually, it was uh, Salomon was offered great insight. Um, for those of you that don't uh, don't recall, Salomon uh, Brothers was the world's biggest uh, uh, bond trader. Uh, it was uh, really pretty much was the government bond markets uh, for a long, long time. Uh, it ran into the the buffers around 1990, 1991, uh, with some uh, some unfortunate trickery that went on. But I think I'll leave that for uh, for you to read in the in the press or pick up Liars Poker by um, uh, Michael Lewis or whatever. But um, those are good introductions. But Salomon Brothers basically did a lot of innovative in, innovative work in finance. It, uh, uh, it was a lot of stuff on bond duration. Uh, Salomon pretty much was the pioneer in that stuff. Uh, actually, if you go right back to the development of the yield curve, the whole idea of arbitraging a continuous yield curve was already a Salomon Brothers idea. So many of the things that we look at and use in global finance now had their origins um, uh, at Salomon Brothers um, International, basically. Brilliant. So before we crack on with this um, conversation, which is... Um, Clearly not investment advice. We're just going to show a little disclaimer if my um, screen will move. Why does it do this to you? There we go. Um, so please have a look at that. Um, not investment advice, as I said. So moving on, perhaps you could tell us about um, liquidity. And obviously you think it's very, very important. It obviously is. It's a word we hear about. Um, what is it? And, you know, my, my simple explanation is, is, you know, is it the willingness of markets to provide credit um, or is it something else? Yeah, I think that's a that's a pretty decent heads up, Charlie, in terms of what liquidity is. It's really the uh, the the access to uh, to funding. Uh, liquidity is a funding concept. Uh, it was critical to understand uh, liquidity when I was at Salomon Brothers. I mean, uh, you really had to understand funding if you were interested in credit markets and fixed income markets and also forex markets. And that now is becoming particularly important if you want to understand equity markets or already any asset class. Uh, it's all driven by liquidity or as we talk about global liquidity, because liquidity is largely fungible. It will, it will shift around. Now, what we think of here is uh, a pool of money, fast moving money. Uh, of about $170 trillion. So it uh, easily swamps world GDP, uh, about one and three quarter times bigger. Um, it um, uh, it moves, as we said, globally. It is a measure of balance sheet capacity. In other words, the ability of credit providers to provide funding or credit uh, to markets. It is not money supply. We keep hammering that point home. Money supply is a sort of somewhat archaic definition. It may have some relevance to understanding what goes on in the real economy, but it really is an insufficient tool to understand what goes on in financial markets. Money supply is much, much smaller. It's only defined as the uh, as the retail uh, deposits uh, of re of high street banks. Uh, the financial sector is a lot, lot bigger and more important than uh, high street banks. High street banks probably dominated in the 1950s or early 1960s. So money supply was not a bad heads up then, but it clearly has been uh, uh, easily surpassed since then. So global liquidity is really what we're looking at. It's a major factor in asset allocation. And knowing where the money is, is a critical element uh, to understand where markets are traveling. And in your work, which is excellent, by the way, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, you, you talk about when private debt fails, that is a deflationary event. And we saw that in spades in 2008 and, of course, during the Asia crisis and so forth. But you're saying that when public debt fails, something else happens. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that, there's a very clear difference between the two. Um, what uh, what happens in the private sector is when you get de de uh, debt defaults, so you basically get deflationary pressures occurring. I mean, that's uh, we've seen that many times. And as you highlight, 
uh, looking at 2008 is a, is a very good example of that particular episode. Uh, equally, if you go back and look at the Asian crisis in 1997, again, another major debt default, uh, that was, again, hugely deflationary. Uh, what we're seeing in China right now is another great example of that. Uh, what you're seeing is a classic debt deflation going on in China. Uh, China has is struggling under the weight of debt, particularly real estate debt. And you can see what's happening to the prices in China, uh, not only in the stock market or in the real estate markets, but also in the high street. Uh, China is suffering deflation. It's a classic debt deflation, uh, pretty much like America went through in the 19, early 1930s. So that's what private debt does. If you get default problems, it's deflationary. On the other hand, governments don't default or very rarely or certainly uh, reserve currencies uh, don't default. And uh, what happens there is you get a monetary inflation as the way out. So effectively, uh, governments can always pay their debts because they can force the likes of you and I to actually hold their, their paper, their paper money. Uh, we're forced to hold pound sterling or uh, US dollars or whatever it may be, or Japanese yen. And basically, that's how governments will always pay their debts. They will pay, they will pay in their own currency. Uh, clearly, if you have an example where you've got a foreign currency borrowing, so if Britain borrowed in American dollars, then there will be a problem in paying back. But for the most part, uh, major economies uh, essentially uh, borrow in their own currencies or ma major governments borrowing their own currencies. And that's the problem. So what happens is, uh, unlike 2000 and uh, 7 2008, the global financial crisis. We're now in a world where you've got uh, whopping great levels of public debt. Uh, you know, just look at some of the eye watering numbers that you're seeing uh, emerging out of the COVID crisis. Uh, COVID crisis was the first example we've had of, of a major global crisis where uh, there was no increase in taxation or cut in spending. Governments just basically went to the checkbook and just wrote a big fat check uh, to everybody, uh, and they're paying for that with more debt. And you can see America, even America is struggling uh, to fund itself right now. And that's the upward pressure on global bond yields. Monetary inflation, which is turning to the central banks to print money, uh, either directly or through the back door, to fund governments, is coming to a high street near you fast. Uh, this is the problem we've all got to wake up and see. Uh, monetary inflation is here and monetary inflation needs to be guarded against. OK, so monetary inflation and consumer inflation are different. Can you please, please explain the difference? Um, and does one feed the other or not? Yes, I mean, there, there are two very different concepts here. One is what affects people in the high street. Uh, that is high street inflation, consumer price inflation, CPI, whatever one likes to think of. Um, that is something which is really a hybrid of other inflationary factors. And the two factors that go into uh, driving high street prices in our, oh, its two moving parts are number one, monetary inflation or deflation. Monetary inflation is one. And the other is cost inflation or deflation. Now, if you look at the history of economies, what you find is over the very long term, the private sector, because the private sector is efficient and it has productivity gains, etc., tends to create cost deflation. So generally, costs come down. I mean, you can see that very clearly if you just look at technology and look at the price of computers or mobile phones and do, look, you know, see how much their prices have collapsed uh, over the last two or three decades. Now, that is cost deflation. And generally, you tend to see that in the world economy, except when you don't. And those instances may be that oil prices spike up or uh, there are heightened wage demands or uh, you get supply side difficulties like after COVID. Those are when you get episodes and they're probably rare, but they're meaningful episodes of cost inflation. Uh, on the other hand, the other component to high street inflation is uh, destroying the value of paper money. Uh, in other words, uh, printing money or creating monetary inflation by the central banks. Uh, and that is effectively a currency devaluation. And the easiest way to see that is to look at, uh, get, look at currencies against gold. Uh, gold is a long term benchmark. Uh, it, gold is not a hedge against high street inflation necessarily, but it's a brilliant hedge against monetary inflation. And what you've got to think about is that we're in a world now where you've got monetary inflation. Now, it may well be that there are alternatives to gold as a monetary inflation hedge. And that's what you know we as investors have got to try and search out. But generally, over the very long term, gold has been a brilliant hedge. Excellent. And you, you talk about the cycles, don't you? So you've got a six year cycle on global liquidity. Perhaps you can walk us through that. 
Yes, well, this is sort of straying into the realms of sort of wonkish um, uh, financial theory and uh, monitoring what central banks are doing. But one of the tasks that we give ourselves across border capital is to understand these flows of money. And this is what we've been tracking for years or if not decades. And basically what this chart in front of you shows is a plot uh, shown by the black line of money th money flows through global financial markets. And you know, if you look at that chart and maybe go you know, slightly uh, eyes narrowed or slightly uh, squint, you'll see that there is a regular cycle, which we tried to sort of aid the eye with that uh, uh, dotted sine wave that we put on top of that. Now, just to show that we're not cheating, uh, I can assure you that that dotted line, that sine wave was actually uh, developed and put in place in year 2000 uh, using then mathematical techniques to fit it. And it's been simply extrapolated using the same five to six year frequency uh, going forward ever since. So it's been running for 25 years, uh, tracking as you see. So what you see is what you get. And lo and behold, it seems as if that cycle is intact and it seems to have captured the COVID cycle almost perfectly. Now, what we're seeing right now is in terms of money flow globally. And as I stress, this is a, a measure of global liquidity momentum moving through financial markets worldwide. That is bottomed. It bottomed in October of 2022. Uh, that bottoming, uh, for those of people that have got uh, you know decent memories, uh, occurred just in the wake of the British guilt crisis in September uh, with the Liz Truss uh, budget. And that budget uh, debacle uh, basically was a wake-up call for policymakers around the world. And what you saw in the in the uh, in the aftermath of that crisis was central banks beginning to start push li pushing liquidity back into their into their markets, uh, and that was the inflection point, the major inflection point. It was reinforced a few months later uh, by activities uh, in America, where the Federal Reserve was forced to bail out uh, some banks, Silicon Valley Bank, for example, and then there was also concerted effort to try and support. Um, uh, the uh, try and support banks generally with the failure of Credit Suisse versus Boston and its uh, uh, absorption by UBS. So these banking problems tend to occur around the troughs of the cycle and asset market booms occur much more around the peaks of the cycle. So what we're looking at here is an environment where investors should be feeling the wind behind them because monetary inflation or global liquidity, if you like, uh, is starting to pick up. So assets that are very sensitive to liquidity have been gaining significantly. Uh, Viz, for example, cryptocurrencies. Uh, another example would be US technology stocks. These are the things that start to move strongly when you've got liquidity rising. And what you will see in coming weeks is likely to be a steepening of yield curves and growing evidence that that liquidity is feeding into real economies. And so the world economy should be bottoming out. So this is very exciting. We've got two years of, uh, of, of increased uh, liquidity. How, how is the love shared by geography and by asset class? And so, you know, you've already said there's a debt deflation problem in China. Um, you know, what is the impact of all this on, you know, Japan versus China versus US versus Europe? And then perhaps when, when you've done that, then perhaps we can go to the asset classes and, and talk through those. Of course. The central banks that really matter uh, in the world uh, you can really count on uh, on two fingers, which is uh, the US Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China. Uh, they're a bit part players. I mean, one, I have to mention uh, Bank of Japan because the Bank of Japan historically has been very important, but Japan is now a much smaller relative economy uh, in the world economy uh, and uh, its financial markets are nowhere near as dominant as they maybe were uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, same, unfortunately, for Britain and the same, of course, for Europe. Uh, the ECB, you know, makes a loud noise, but it's largely irrelevant in the equation. Uh, it tends to follow in many cases what the Federal Reserve is doing. Uh, what is the Federal Reserve doing? Uh, the Federal Reserve is basically uh, on an easing cycle at the moment. Uh, it may not feel like that exactly, but uh, broadly speaking, all we're debating is not necessarily the direction of interest rates. They're coming down. It's the speed and the scale of that drop, which is really the debate now. And that will be conditioned by uh, economic uh, events in, in America. But, you know, we can assure you that that, uh, that path is uh, now a lot more benign. Uh, that will mean liquidity goes into the U.S. economy and U.S. financial markets. It will probably go in at a faster pace than people would expect. 
uh, and it will uh, likely uh, preempt movements in interest rates anyway. And if you just look at the size of the Federal Reserve, uh, not just the Federal Reserve balance sheet, but actually the liquidity creating parts of the balance sheet, you're already starting to see a very noticeable pickup in those elements. Uh, the other central bank that is worth thinking about, oh, sorry, I should just add to that. What What's the particular uh, motive uh, behind the Federal Reserve doing this? It's really to maintain the integrity of US banks. The more uh, concern that you see in the markets about uh, the health of whether it be New York Community Bank lately or whatever, these concerns about regional banks uh, is something which is great, great concern to the US Treasury, particularly in, the, in an election year. Uh, Janet Yellen is probably one of the most political uh, Treasury sectors I've seen for a long, long time, and she will in, want to ensure that the Democrats get back. So uh, they do not want upsets this year. And any hint that there are problems in the uh, in the regional banking sector, they will need liquidity to be put into US money markets. And that's really the modus operandi of what they're doing. The other big central bank is China. Uh, China has serious problems uh, under the weight of debt. Uh, China needs or China is suffering uh, the same sort of plight that Japan suffered uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, it's suffering the same sort of plight that America went through in the 1930s and the same problems that emerging Asia saw uh, in the late 1990s. And that basically requires a major liquidity infusion and a significant devaluation of the Chinese yuan. And that, we think, is in train. If you monitor what the People's Bank of China is doing, which we do uh, for our sins on a daily basis, since June of last year, they have plowed something like seven and a half trillion yuan. So we're talking about over $100 billion dollars into their money markets to try and support the economy uh, and the financial system. And there'll be an awful lot more coming over coming months. So what you're looking at is the two major central banks worldwide uh, have got the money taps pretty wide open or about to get them wide open. And the ECB and the Bank of England will follow despite what their rhetoric may currently be. So just ignore what they're saying. Alongside the Bank of Japan is easing liquidity. Uh, it didn't do that so much last year, but it certainly is beginning to uh, join this party and opening uh, their money taps too. So uh, among the big central banks, you're seeing this very, very clear sea change. And think of this as a super tanker, rather like this liquidity uh, cycle that is shifting direction. Uh, and that is what we need to uh, take on board. Fine. So um, caution on China. Because I get lots of people that writing to me saying, should we be buying China? And you're saying um, debt deflation coming, not yet. No, I'm not necessarily saying that, Charlie. What I'm saying is that uh, they're, they're finding the solution to that. So at some stage in coming months, the Chinese market will find a bottom and probably a decent bottom. Uh, the issue, I think, to compare is if you look at what Japan did, Japan pretty much took 20 years to actually get round to the right solution. Uh, Emerging Asia took a, maybe a year or two. Uh, America uh, in the 1930s did it relatively quickly after the depression. Uh, they devalued they devalued the dollar against gold by I think it was about 40 uh, percent in the uh, in the run up to uh, 1934 January 1934. So there was a significant devaluation there. Uh, Japan has actually enacted now a very significant devaluation of the yen, and that is now causing the Japanese financial markets to lift off significantly. Exactly the same happened in emerging Asia. Once China devalues and puts a lot of liquidity back, which is beginning to do, uh, watch this space. Look at the yuan against the US dollar or generally against other units. And you will start to see, I think, the Chinese markets beginning to form bottom. And that's the thing to do. Uh, it's not necessarily the time to bail out now. It's the time to wait and look for a reentry point. So it's the, de the, the devaluation is the trigger, basically. For yeah, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's coming. And then before we get on to crypto and gold, which is why we're all here, can you just uh, lastly just go through the asset classes um, and impact on liquidity? So, you know, bonds, equities, commodities, and uh, and then we'll move on to crypto and gold. Yeah, I mean, you, you're saying what, what are the what are the sort of the sensitivities, I think, is, yes. is your question. Uh, well, I mean, the, the point is that if you look at let's run through the asset classes, uh, short term bonds, uh, there's a carry, an interest rate carry. So if interest rates come down, uh, that clearly is not that good. If you look at the long end of the bond market, uh, they tend to react negatively to rising liquidity. That's contrary 
to what many commentators say, and it's certainly against the narrative of central banks who seem to argue that QT is designed to push yields down. Well, I would just say, look at the evidence. It's actually done every time they've used QT, QE or QT. It's done the opposite of what they say. QE tends to raise uh, bond yields. QT tends to drop bond yields. Uh, and generally, if you're in a rising liquidity environment, the yield curve will steepen, and that isn't necessarily a great time to be buying duration in the bond markets. So bonds are not an asset class to think of in a monetary inflation, either short term or more, more particularly long term. You don't want bonds. In terms of equity markets, it's really a question of looking at uh, those equity markets that are seeing or feeling, uh, if you like, the, the force of the liquidity hose. And uh, that's definitely, uh, at the moment, Japan. It's definitely the US. It may soon become China. It's not yet the UK. Uh, and with maybe early, early stages with the Eurozone. But what you want to have in those markets are initially things that are very sensitive to uh, to liquidity, like long duration investments, such as technology stocks. They're the things that would move uh, initially uh, or traditional interest rate sensitive plays like house builders. Those are at the front end of the cycle. Uh, moving on from that, you would start to see evidence probably in the next few months. And we have clearly we've had in America about 15 months of rally anyway in technology. We're going to start to rotate in the market towards things like financials or commodity based stocks. And then finally, you get to other asset classes, which are more traditional monetary hedges, things like gold or maybe, maybe cryptocurrencies. Uh, gold, uh, as the you know, force of monetary inflation begins or starts to pick up momentum, gold is likely to perform significantly. And then other precious metals will move alongside gold. Uh, the chart you show is a long term view of monetary inflation. Uh, so this goes right back to 1975. The black line is our measure of global liquidity measured uh, on the right hand scale in trillions of dollars. Uh, that has gone from virtually nothing in terms of a global liquidity pool to over 200 trillion projected by the end of 2025. Uh, you can see the scale of that, uh, of how that's increased, uh, particularly the big jumps around the time of the COVID crisis, uh, etc., uh, and the dotted line that we've put against that is American consumer price inflation or the CPI index, rather, uh, which shows on that same scale how much global liquidity has outpaced high street prices. Uh, remember that global liquidity is really a financial market measure. So one would imagine that it would likely have a much more, a much more, uh, much more of an effect, I should say, on financial assets. And what we've got charted here in orange is the comparative movement of the universe of gold uh, by market value and cryptocurrencies. So, you know, clearly, if you go back beyond about 2015, there's a, a zip, big, big fat zero there for cryptocurrencies. But uh, it's all it's all gold in the period up to about 2015. But thereafter. Uh, the importance of crypto in that equation starts to go up. Now, it may be, and we sort of, you know, somewhat flippantly perhaps or tongue in cheek, suggest that crypto may be exponential gold. Uh, certainly that's how it's performed recently. A lot of the statistical work we do, which is actually comparing the hedging abilities of gold and uh, crypto uh, against global liquidity, finds that uh, crypto is incredibly sensitive to global liquidity. The lead times are quite narrow. They're about sort of six weeks or so after a surge in liquidity, you get a crypto pickup. In gold, it tends to be more about six months. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's that sort of time frame. And in terms of the sensitivity, crypto is about five times as sensitive or certainly has been over the last few years to changes in liquidity than the price of gold uh, has been. But gold is clearly a, a very sensitive factor to move movements in liquidity, as you can see, but crypto is that exponential edge. And and it's and this is why we, you know, I got in touch with you because I was fascinated by your work. 
uh, which we'll come to in a minute. But basically, you know, we here at Bytree have got the um, a, an index we call Bold, which it, which combines um, Bitcoin and gold on a risk adjusted basis. So I was going to very quickly uh, show you how this works. It's dead simple finance. And, um, you know, we take the 360 day volatility of Bitcoin, which is just under 40 percent. We take the same for gold, which is just under, you know, between 15 and 20 generally. Um, and then we basically invert it using a very simple um, equation. But I would make the point that people always say how Bitcoin is so volatile. You know, back in 2012, 13, 14, it was, you know, to put it in respect of 150 percent um, um, volatility is something you just don't see in, in stock markets, maybe only in junior small caps or something. Um, but, you know, most of the fangs are the top seven stocks in the world, Tesla, NVIDIA, um, and, and and even Google, actually, and Meta, all of them are more volatile than Bitcoin. Only um, only Microsoft and Apple and 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 um, are, are less volatile, which I think surprises people. But gold is very stable. So we've got a sort of inverse thing going on. Straight out of a CFA textbook is this equation to to um, uh, to calculate the risk adjusted weights. And so we put in the, the 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 gold volatility, the Bitcoin volatility. This happens every month. So magic mathematics, which you can uh, look at in your own time it's on our website uh, bytree.com and then out comes the weight and, and and on the last trading day of each month the index is rebalanced at three o'clock um, in the afternoon which is the london gold fix for maximum um, liquidity and the point of rebalancing transactions are, are partly to manage the risk and keep you know keep the portfolio in check but also when you've got uncorrelated assets um, there's an excess return associated with that this is why bonds and equities have been rebalanced in portfolios uh, for many many years by large institutions um, you can see here the historic asset allocation over the last few years of Bitcoin and gold in the bold index with the um, index overlaid in blue. And then we how's it done? Everyone wants to know how it's done. And so, you know, I've uh, craftily chosen the, the Bitcoin high in uh, the 16th of December 2017 when it just 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 fell short of uh, uh, $20,000. And today, Bitcoin is $46,000. So it's more than doubled in the last six years. People think it's done, done much better than that. But of course, it's had a rocky ride. And the bold index has basically done the same as Bitcoin with a fraction of the volatility um, over that period. And gold is slightly ahead of the stock market without dividends. Um, and, and, and there you have it. And then the final slide I'm going to uh, show you before we go back um, to Michael is the excess return um, from the bold index over buy and hold. So if you took the risk weights, um, at a period in time, you know, back in 2018 or what have you, and didn't rebalance versus if you did rebalance, there's an annualized excess return most of the time. So in 2016 and 17, you would probably be better off without bold because Bitcoin did so incredibly well, you know, appreciating 200 fold. There's no strategy that beats that. Um, but since that time, you know, most of the time you've done very well by having rebalancing transactions. And I think everyone who owns Bitcoin and gold should consider the idea of having a risk weighted, you know, basically three, uh, three or four to one um, with, with the emphasis on gold. And the only times that it's been a bad idea to own uh, bold as opposed to the individuals has been when Bitcoin has been distressed. So at the end of 18, uh, Bitcoin is 3,000, and the COVID crisis, it's 5,000. And then we've got the Terra Luna and the um, Bankman fraud uh, type events in 2022. So provided, so if Bitcoin's down, then basically buy Bitcoin. But at other times, if it's up like now, then the, the chances are over the next few years, you'll probably um, outperform um, buy and hold by rebalancing. So that's the point, 5% alpha uh, pre-balancing transactions over time. And the only reason you wouldn't do that is because you, you, you hold the view that Bitcoin is just going to go absolutely nuts. Um, and I think you know, the laws of big numbers mean that's less likely in the future than it, than it has been in the past. Now, Michael, you were very kind um, when I emailed you to, um, we, you know, I watched you on Russell Nabier's platform. I thought, brilliant, this is, this is, this is really what we need to, uh, to get together and talk about, bold and your liquidity. And he sent the chart back to me. So perhaps you can talk us through the difference between um, our bold and your crypto and gold. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the answer is that it's probably very similar. Uh, what I show here is uh, this is uh, short term tracking. So we looked at the bold one index that was on Bloomberg uh, at, at, uh, at your hinting. And it actually shows a remarkably close correlation uh, with our global liquidity index. Now, the global liquidity index in orange is actually our weekly estimates of global liquidity from around the world. I mean, just to uh, to say a couple of words about how we do that, uh, we are in touch with uh, about 90 central banks and financial systems worldwide 
thankfully now this is all electronically uh, or data is electronically stripped from uh, from various uh, databases and we run these models uh, we have run them daily but we we publish on a weekly basis what the total global liquidity is now these are sort of flash estimates uh, that we uh, that we reinforce each month uh, with with solid data but basically they give a really good heads up to the course of uh, how liquidity is changing and what you can see in the graph here are these weekly estimates and they're basically tracked against bold so it looks as if the bold index is uh, a very very good proxy for what happens with liquidity now if you uh, do a more detailed statistical analysis of this data uh, what you'll see is actually global liquidity leads bold so if you want if you believe in global liquidity you believe global liquidity is going up then this is actually probably a fairly decent investment i'm certainly going to have a look at it myself but i think that you know the other point to make is that it seems like it's being driven uh, by sensible economic or monetary factors uh, and liquidity can be shown statistically we do a lot of thorough statistical work and testing as it seems to lead uh, the bold index by around about sort of six weeks or so. So it's pretty much on track with what we found with other crypto, uh, with generally cryptocurrencies. And I like the way you say that it's got a lead time on Bitcoin of around six weeks and on gold around six months, you know, nailing down the idea these assets have low or negative correlation much of the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the day that's no longer true is the day that bold doesn't no longer serves a purpose. But I just can't see it happening for a very long time. It's so obvious that the bold is, you know, gold is a, it's a risk off um, instrument, whereas Bitcoin is a risk on instrument, to put it into very simple layman's terms. And I can't see that changing anytime soon. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, this is just this is music, music to my eyes, if there's such a thing. Um, <laughs> and, and to talk about, uh, you know, who we are at Bytree, if, if you're if you're seeing this for the first time, we're a research house. I've been writing the multi-asset investor for a long time, balanced portfolios, global equities. I've been covering gold for years. Atomic is um, is about Bitcoin. Uh, Atlas Parcel and Atomic are free, by the way. Uh, Venture is by UK um, and and increasingly global, uh, smaller mid caps, deep value strategy, and um, and we've also got Robert, Robin Griffiths's um, alternative. Um, as an allocation report, which I'm afraid there's no room for a fifth box. Um, and then more importantly, if you don't like our research, then then um, consider uh, Cross-Border Capital's excellent um, substack, which is Capital Wars. So I subscribe to it. And you've got a couple of links on the right, um, which I think Cross-Border Capital's got some funds. Um, and it, obviously it's got this research service as well, which is um, which is highly recommended. Uh, Michael, anything you'd like to say on, on, on what you do with your funds or, or research? Well, I can uh, I can say a, a few things. I mean, we have um, uh, we we tend to most of the money we run is fixed income money. Um, we we don't have a strategy, where, unlike you, which is uh, Bitcoin or crypto based. Uh, we run a, a, a listed uh, fund in Switzerland, which is uh, a, a global macro fund, uh, which you know, is open, obviously open to investors uh, to, to look at. Uh, our research offerings are really kind of twofold. I mean, we uh, we consult to, to many institutions worldwide um, and that well, the details are on our website. Or if you want a sort of, uh, let's say, a, a much cut down version of that uh, without without access to data, but uh, with some of the ideas or themes, uh, then look at our Capital Wars uh, sub -stack. Uh, Capital Wars is named after a, a book I wrote a few years ago about the global liquidity phenomenon, which which is you know slightly wonkish, is a bit of a, an academic textbook, but it basically brings together all of these ideas. And is uh, the Capital Wars notion is that you know world financial systems are at war with one another, and um, that is what is going on now between the U.S. and China. Indeed, indeed. And I just decided to write a book. I decided yesterday, and I'm going to do it. <laughs> Good for you. I've been thinking about it for years, but I'm going to do it. Um, and and contact us is, is the last thing. So with that, can I just, I'll go back to the more interesting slide, um, which is what it's all about. I mean, I just love that. Thank you so much for that slide. And thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been thoroughly enjoyable to um, have you on Bike Tree. Great pleasure, Charlie. Thank you.